Hey everybody, welcome to Microbiology of Infectious Diseases at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dr. Cummings. Uh, in the last video, I introduced you to uh, the eukaryotes and the three main types of eukaryotic pathogens. And so in this video, we're going to focus in on the fungal pathogens, those that are fungi. Fungal pathogens tend to take one of two forms, a yeast form or a mold form. Reality is fungi have fungi have very complicated life cycles and some of them can cycle between a mold stage and a yeast stage but in general the pathogens that are yeasts live as yeasts the pathogens that are molds live as molds so we're going to talk about what it means to be a fungus and what it means to be a yeast or a mold and give you, I'll give you some specific examples that you should learn uh, of pathogens and infections from both of those categories let me quickly remind you and this came from the last video, let me quickly remind you that the fungi are in the domain eukarya, closely related both to plants and animals and much more closely related to plants and animals than they are to the bacteria or to the viruses which aren't even on the tree of life. Now when I say that, that a fungus is a eukaryote, a lot of information should backfill your mind immediately that should be available associated with that. You should remember a lot about what its genome must be like in terms of it being far larger and more complex than we're going to see in viruses or bacteria. And you should remember that the individual cells, whether it's a yeast or a fungus, are going to be larger than the prokaryotic cells, way larger than viruses, uh, and they're going to be highly complex in terms of compartmentalization, everything from a nucleus, which is sort of the defining structure, though it's not the only distinction, to the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, etc. So make sure that word eukaryote has, um, has a full and rich meaning to you, both phylogenetically and in terms of the structure and genome of the cells that we're talking about. Now, I've said before, there are three main types of eukaryotic pathogens. We need to understand eukaryotes for a couple of reasons. One, because human beings are eukaryotes. And hopefully the context of your anatomy and physiology courses really emphasizes the eukaryotic nature of human beings. But there are some pathogens that are eukaryotic as well. And those are the fungi, the protozoa, and the helminths. So in this video, we'll talk about the fungi. In the next two, we'll talk about the protozoa and the helminths. So you can tell this is a mold here. This guy down here is a protozoan, that's Giardia, and here is a helminth, in this case a, a worm coming out of a person's liver. All right, so I said there are two main forms or categories of fungi. There are the yeast forms and the mold forms. The yeast forms, the most common are going to be Candida. Okay, so Candida albicans is a very common yeast that causes infection in humans. Uh, when we talk about someone having a yeast infection, whether it's a vaginal yeast infection or a cutaneous, a skin-based yeast infection, we're typically talking about candida infections. Um, if you look at an image just under the microscope that's been stained, of course, it's not naturally purple, you can see that they take on kind of a roughly oval shape, uh, and they, there's a variety, there's a, a, a heterogeneity to their sizes and their overall shape. Um, but, but roughly they're an oval shape. They're much larger than the bacteria um, and vastly, infinitely larger than viruses, but they do tend to be smaller than typical human cells. Here we've got an electron microscope image. Uh, this is called a transmission electron micrograph where they've actually sliced through the cell. And what we can see is cytoplasm, surrounding a nucleus. Let me get this picture out of the way. Surrounding a nucleus, it got a little squished in the process, but that's the nucleus. You can see mitochondria, many, many mitochondria all the way around. In here, we've also got an organelle called a vacuole. Yeasts have these large vacuoles where they store a lot of metabolites, a lot of nutrients they could need for a future uh, for future metabolism. So for example, they store calcium, phosphate, they store a bunch of amino acids in there, things they might need later. Um, so it's a, a pretty cool little storage structure they have. All cellular life forms have to have a, 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 a plasma membrane. And that's this inner line here. That's a phospholipid bilayer that really determines what can come and go from the cell. And yeasts, like all fungi, have a cell wall. And the cell wall of yeast is, is made of chitin. Let me get this out of the way and we can see it in the diagram here. 
So this yellow represents the chitin cell wall. What's really cool about that is chitin is the same polysaccharide that you see that makes the exoskeleton of crabs and, um, and lobsters and shrimp, right? That crunchy exoskeleton. So really what we have is this very, very tough little tank of a cell that has the physical structure and the physical support of something like a crab or a lobster. I just think that's really neat that it's the same structure essentially. You can see the diagram showing the cytoplasm, the nucleus, that storage vacuole, a bunch of mitochondria. Uh, of course there are going to be ribosomes in there and uh, a lot of metabolites in there. So yeasts can form vaginal yeast infections very commonly and they can cause various cutaneous yeast infections. And because the genus name is Candida, we often refer to these as Candidiasis. You can add iasis to the, the, the name of just about any organism to describe the disease. So these are often referred to as candidiases. One other quick thing I want to mention since we're early in the course here. When we give a Latin taxonomic name to an organism, if it's typed, it's going to be in italics. You notice the word yeast is not in italics. That's not a Latin name. Here we have a genus and species name that have been sort of validated, if you will. It's not just a common term or a colloquial term. These are the scientific, technical, taxonomic terms. The first term is the genus. That's a large category. And within a genus, you have multiple species that are very similar to each other. So we have the genus Candida. There are multiple species within it, but albicans seems to be the one that gives us humans the most trouble. The other thing you notice is that the genus name has a capital letter and the species name has lowercase. If we were talking frequently about Candida albicans, we would name it fully the first time and then we could just say C. albicans afterwards, just like E. coli. E is not the first name of E. coli, it's Escherichia, but we can abbreviate it and call it E. Period coli. Um, so get familiar with recognizing when we're giving a very specific name like a genus and species name. So those are the yeasts. Oh, here's a cutaneous uh, yeast infection, an oral yeast infection uh, that we call thrush. So if it's in the mouth, the throat, the esophagus, we call it thrush. You can see this is the back of someone's throat. Here's the uvula. You've got the tonsils on either side. And it's essentially heavy colony growth of candida growing in there. Um, these yeast infections can be pretty tricky uh, to fight, partly because they're eukaryotes and we're eukaryotes, which means that any anti-eukaryote pharmaceutical we try to attack them with is very likely to have some side effects on us as well and so we have to be very cautious in the quantities we use etc and so it can take quite a while to get rid of uh, a yeast infection same is true with a mold type fungal infection let me get this out of the way real quick um, this is uh, up the upper right is an example of a, a mold called aspergillus now you notice it's it's in italics, so this is its official scientific name. Capital A tells us this is the genus, which means there are multiple species within it. And when we say SPP, it's just sort of a placeholder for any of the species. So just about any of the species within the genus Aspergillus can cause asthma or pneumonia, particularly in an immunocompromised host. Um, you and I, if you're not immunocompromised, are not very likely to get some sort of a, a mold infection in the lungs, whether it's asthma or pneumonia. Very uncommon. Becomes a very important uh, pathogen of people with, for example, uh, HIV, right? If they have active AIDS, their immune system is suppressed, and all of a sudden, aspergillus and other molds like to take hold in the lungs. It's a, it can become deadly, in fact two main structures and they're essentially the same thing. If you look at the diagram here, there are what are called aerial hyphae. These molds are multicellular fungi, right? We said yeast are single-celled fungi. The molds are multicellular fungi and they have these aerial hyphae, which are sort of like stalks on a plant almost. And way up here, waving in the breeze, kind of looks like a palm tree, is some sort of a sporophore. And the sporophore is a structure that has spores and fungal spores are the reproductive structures. You can think of them almost like seeds on a plant. And they need something to disperse them, just like a seed needs something to disperse it. And the wind is most common. You know, air movement is the most common, but sometimes water movement for these, uh, these uh, fungal spores. Fungal spores are tough, and they can withstand some pretty harsh conditions. And like a seed, when they find some nutrient-rich environment they can grab onto, they will germinate, just like a seed will germinate, and they'll form this large complex structure again, where they have more aerial hyphae rooted by what are called rhizoid hyphae, and rhizoid simply means root-like. 
that are going horizontal. So if you're in soil, for example, they'll be grabbing onto soil particles, just like a root system would. They have an aerial hyphae that'll reach up high and create the different types of sporophores, either these spherical ones called sporangiophore or these sort of fluffy ones called uh, conidiophores, uh, in order to distribute their, their spores. Those spores can be really dangerous if you're immunocompromised. And maybe you're not immunocompromised, but maybe your patient is. Maybe someone you're caring for is. And so we really do need to keep these spores that are airborne uh, under control and in mind as we think about protecting ourselves and protecting our patients. Now, if it's cutaneous, we could think of cutaneous as skin, hair, or nails. We collectively call these tinea infections. You notice tinea is not an italics. This is not the Latin name for it, but it is a common name that talks about or refers to this collection of skin, hair, or nail fungal infections by one of these molds. These three molds here are the most common, Epidermophyton, capital E italics tells you that's a genus. There are multiple species within that genus. Trichophyton and microsporum. If you go to Walmart and you walk down the pharmaceutical aisle and you find a tube of some kind of a, an antifungal, you're very likely to find the, these three genus names, maybe even specific species, but you're very likely going to find these three genus names and you'll probably find the word tinea. So understanding that it's used for skin, hair, or nails. So then there's other common names. So if it's on the skin, but it's in the groin area, we call it athlete's foot. Uh, pardon me, we call it chalk itch. If it's on the feet, we call it athlete's foot. If it's somewhere on open skin, like on a hand or an arm, we call it ringworm. If it's on the nails, we call it onychomycosis, right? So there's a variety of ways it can express itself on the body, depending on uh, the whole interaction between what species is causing the infection, where it initially attached to the human anatomy, and what uh, the person's overall makeup is as well, uh, including things like their um, their immunostatus, etc. So we've got yeasts, we've got molds, we've got a variety of these infections, um, and they are actually relatively common, with the exception of that mold pneumonia that we talked about, uh, like an Aspergillus type fungal pneumonia, which is uncommon for healthy people, but unfortunately can become common and even deadly in immunocompromised people. <clears throat> Let me summarize with a couple quick big picture take home points uh, so that you have kind of a reminder of the framework we just talked about. Fungi or eukaryotes. Three words really, really packed. Make sure that means a lot to you. Make sure that it, that, that term eukaryote is a very rich, informationally rich term to you. If it means very little to you, if it means nothing more than um, a nucleus, you've got some studying to do. You've really got to dive in and make sure you understand a whole lot better what the eukaryotes are all about. Infectious fungi can take the form of either the yeasts or the molds. The yeasts are the single-celled forms. The molds are the multi-celled forms that have the aerial hyphae and their sporangiophores and their spores that they're releasing. Some common yeast infections include thrush and vaginal candidiasis. We will talk about vaginal candidiasis on and off. We'll refer to it on and off throughout this semester, particularly when we get to antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, etc. So make sure that one really sticks for you. And then um, we'll say that common mold infections include the tinnias. And I'm going to say that those are the common ones, but we also know that um, some mold infections can trigger asthma or even pneumonia. Those seem to be a lot less common. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned a lot. Watch it as many times as you need to.